Hi, everybody. Welcome to the MRP Tech Podcast. This is episode 178. My name is Matt, and this is the weekly podcast discussing everyday tech for everyday people. In this week's episode, I'd like to go down a rabbit hole of a story that I've been working on for the last few months. And it's going to involve some technology stuff in it, but it's also just to fill in listeners about something that I have been working on that I mentioned a couple episodes ago. Now, if you go to my website, mrptechreviews.com, and scroll down a little bit, you'll see some recent episodes. And it was just a few episodes ago, episode 175, where I was researching a an old story that I had heard about uh, a Cold War bunker being in my area. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to track down if it existed, if it was real, if it was more of a just local lore or anything like that. And I had no idea where to start. So I basically branched out in every way that I could think of to uh, sort of find out if this bunker was real. And if you go back and listen to that episode, I get pretty excited um, for some of these sort of side tangents that I went off on. And one of the stories that um, I'm going to get into today is just sort of an, an adventure that I've had recently. Now, it's not going to be a, a super high-tech uh, story, but I thought I would just update the listeners of this show because some people seem to be pretty interested in it. Now, so as I was researching the the Cold War bunker, which um, I ultimately ended up finding and found out that it did exist and uh, it still exists today and it's still being used today in, in various uh, storage capacities and tried to get a tour of the facility and uh, it's owned by a very small business. They don't have a whole lot of employees, so they don't have a whole lot of time to, um, you know, accommodate requests like I had. So I was a little bit bummed about that. But uh, in the meantime, uh, what I had done as I was researching this is I came across a story that was just fascinating to me. And basically it says, um, there's a, there's a, there's an old captain in, in military. His name was Elmer Thomas. And Elmer Thomas was uh, someone who was basically working for a, um, a, a lumber company and he was an inspector for uh, a various companies and he was asked to come to my area and um, do some work and some of the locals had told them there was something very interesting on one of the local mountains and he had uh, went for a walk one day near where he was um, being uh, basically near where he was living temporarily. And basically what it had, what he had done is he had come across what he had said to be a large cavern in one of the mountains that was comparable in size to Mammoth Cave in Kentucky. And that, that Mammoth Cave, um, you know, is one of the largest caves in the world. And basically he went in as far as he could. And, um, the, the story goes that the, he, he, there was various drop-offs. Uh, he would toss a rock into the, the abyss and it'd be 15 to 20 seconds before he heard the rock hit. Uh, also, he knows various, various tunnels going in various directions. And it was just an interesting story that I had never heard of um, being a hiker myself. So what I had decided to do was research this a little bit. And um, I wanted to know if this website that I came across was real or not. And sure enough, there were newspaper articles published in 1909 about this discovery of this cave. Now, what I did is I had uh, researched uh, New York State historic newspapers and I searched for these articles. And basically it said in one of the most secluded parts of the Adirondack Mountains in, in New York, a summit of a mountain little frequented by sightseers or sportsmen, uh, Captain E. Thomas of Saranac Lake discovered an opening to a great cavern. He went inside for about a thousand feet and it seemed to no end to the distance that he could penetrate with the technology that technology that allowed him at the time. So, um, so that's a, sort of the origin story behind this great cave of the Adirondacks. And 
um, if you're not familiar with this area, there is caves, but there's not any like huge caves. I mean, there's some large caves, but they're not not nearly comparable to other places in the world. Um, so I, I started digging a little bit deeper and came across a couple other um, articles. And the articles basically say this is in a very secluded area uh, that it seems to be a retreat for very rare wild animals. Um, one of the smaller caves that he had found, there were signs of elk. There, there was um, also uh, an explorer that bought, brought back elk horns. And Captain Thomas, who was a hunter uh, and had a pretty good reputation, found uh, bear tracks. And some of those bear tracks were some of the largest bear that he had ever seen. It's kind of an interesting story. And the newspaper articles go on and on to discover these these things. So... Um, I'm going to show you and I want to talk to you about the trip that I took with uh, my brother. And so when I had gotten this information, I had passed on this information to my brother, who is a, a uh, avid outdoorsman. He likes to hike and um, very interested in um, the story. So I was very busy and I, I was was looking down and I was researching the Cold War bunker still and I sort of passed this on to him and asked him what he thought about it. And the interesting thing about this is that um, the story goes that uh, after its discovery in 1909 by Captain Elmer Thomas, there was locals that had said, whoa, 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 we are aware that this is here. We've been um, going to this particular spot for at least 15 years. So this probably was discovered by locals in the late 1800s, um, and they were the sort of the ones that tipped him off on it. Um, and so then after that, it was sort of forgotten about for a while. And it wasn't until the 1970s that um, a person that was researching doing some research for a book, came across these articles. And eventually, they what they wanted to do was set up a group to travel to find these caves. Now, uh, they eventually did find some caves, and they did not find the mammoth cave that this particular person was talking about. Uh, they, they found some quite large caves, and they found evidence of, of the story that he was trying to tell. And obviously, it was nowhere near in size to... Mammoth Cave in Kentucky, but they were quite large, and they were in a very secluded area. Not many people go to it. So at this point, my brother and I were very interested in the story, and we more or less just wanted to go for a hike and, and take a look at the caves, but we had no idea how to find them. Um, so we started doing research. We, we uh, I did everything that I could, and I'm going to tell you that when you search for these caves, there is no um, record on Google for them. There's no photos of them that are, um, there is a photo from an old newspaper from years ago, but it's so, um, the when the newspapers were scanned back in the day, uh, it was a black and white photo. It wasn't very good. It uh, basically showed no description of the cave whatsoever. So there are no images on Google, which kind of fascinates me. And there are descriptions, but unless you were part of that group, you have no idea what the descriptions really meant. So after uh, a couple of months of research and allowing the winter to sort of come to a close, we decided we were going to take an expedition out to this area. Now, the first thing that we did is we decided to sort of scope out the area. So we took a drive out, and um, this is quite a remote location. There's not a whole lot of people that live in this area, um, and we knew it was going to be a hike to get to the caves no matter which way we went. And so we're trying to find the best route to go in, and I'll leave that all up to my, my brother was the one that sort of plotted this route. He did all the research on this, and um, basically it wasn't until almost the last minute that I sort of came on, uh, just happened to be able to, uh, it was the right timing, happened to be able to uh, start doing some research myself. Okay, so 
Um, I'm going to be a little bit secretive here, and I'll explain why in a little bit. But uh, we we started with a hike, okay? And we were sort of having fun. Now, this hike, um, it is not for uh, just casual hikers. It There's no trail. It's immediately walking through um, thick as any woods I've ever been in. Uh, extremely dense forest. Um this picture does not do it justice, um, and I'm going to get to this picture in just a second uh, if you're watching the YouTube video. The forest is so dense you can get lost very, very easily. The um, amount of trees that you have to navigate, it was it, it was exhausting to, to go through this. And it's about an eight-mile hike with no trail through very dense forest. And, of course, as we're going along, um, we were in pretty good spirits because we were out to find a cave that, that, let's face it, people know about it, but not very many people actually go to this cave. And, um, yes, there are locals that know about it, but... Most people I talk to uh, have no idea about this story. It's just a fascinating story. So I was more interested in the history, history and the historical aspect of this than anything else. So, um, of course, as we're going along, this is at the bottom of the mountain showing this image here. Um, and it's just a picture of a rock. But, uh, you know, we were basically joking the whole way. Every time we saw a rock with any type of cave that we found the cave. Um, and here's another picture. Uh, this is a little closer to the summit. Uh, again, we're looking basically under every single stone looking for caves. And this is just us being ridiculous, uh, sticking a ski pole into underneath a little rock, um, wondering if that was the cave. Obviously it wasn't. Um, so we started off, there was patches of snow and uh, the snow would range from anywhere from uh, no snow at all to uh, a foot and a half to two feet of snow in certain areas uh, where we'd be tr uh, trugging along. And um, because of the warm weather, we'd, we'd basically post hole and we'd end up going deep into the snow. Um, so sometimes it was very easy walking. And then other times it was really um, uh, compacted snow that, that would kind of cave in on you as you were walking. The, the mountain itself is, is pretty rugged. Uh, it's, it's pretty steep and it is, it is um, not an easy climb to say the least. As we got closer to the summit, um, what we started to do is we started to do a search. I'm going to show you that in a little bit. But we found an area that I suspected was, was going to be the area um, where we'd find the caves. And we found various small, um, small caves that I wouldn't even consider a cave. And this image, uh, it, it basically, this is about a, a, I would say, 10 to 12 feet long. And um, it's about a foot and a half to two feet wide. So this is not a cave. This is sort of a, <laughs> uh, just a description of some of the things that we looked in to see if we could find the cave. And so um, the problem that we had was that we had no research. We had research, but we had no way to compare the research to what was said in the research to the actual location. So when we got up to the top of the mountain, which the caves were supposedly located uh, near the summit, um, there was a nice view, uh, several nice, I mean, it was just an absolutely beautiful area. And um, this is a photo of me after the first quick search that we did. We, we sort of expected to find the caves really quickly based on what we had. And um, then we, we decided to sort of regroup and um, we sort of talked a little bit. And what we decided to do was come up with a very rough uh, sort of grid search of the upper portion of this mountain. And this is the look of some of the things that I brought with me. Um, we had a, a bag of supplies, um, a flashlight for searching in the cave. Um, one of the things that I brought with me, and I'll kind of show it here, um, this is my HT. It's a Yezu FT60. Uh, this is an amateur radio. And because when we scoped out the area, um, there's no cell service out in this area. So what we, what I decided to do, I wanted to bring my radio with me because I knew within about 20 miles there was a repeater that I could hit in case of emergency um, because we were in such a secluded area. And so... Um, if you're an avid hiker, I would recommend seriously um, 
to consider getting an amateur radio license just in case your cell phone dies or you are lost or you're injured or whatever because you can hit distances much greater with with a radio like this compared to uh, spotty cell service or what have you so so um, this uh, yezu ft60 will connect to repeaters it also connects um you know it's 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 i've been able to with this repeater with excuse me with this radio it's got a 19 inch antenna that i bought um at the same time doesn't come with it but um I was able to hit repeaters like 25, 26 miles away uh, in, in some circumstances. So uh, it's it's sort of like a security blanket for anybody who likes to go out on these types of uh, adventures. And so the idea here is we came prepared and being... I wouldn't consider myself an expert hiker, but... but um, just somebody who knows how to be prepared for certain things. Um, we were prepared for all types of weather, whether it was it was supposed supposed to be cold in the morning and it was supposed to get warmer throughout the day. Uh, we were prepared for just about everything. Um, I've actually um, had safety glasses on because that's how thick the the, the trees were. Um, we were we were working our way through brush and everything else you can imagine smacking you in the face um, and safety glasses masks everything we could do to not get beat up and we still got beat up quite a bit as we were doing this um, this is a, a, a photo of me on the second trip that we took and i'm going to get to that in just a little bit so this is a photo of sort of the grid search that we did on the upper side of the mountain now this is only one person's search and it looks a little chaotic and the reason it looks chaotic is because of the way the mountain is formed um, we started on the summit of the mountain and sort of did these loops at first around the upper part of the summit based on the research that we did and we suddenly realized that um, the research didn't make a whole lot of sense and we started kind of this grid pattern and every th these red lines that you see in this picture, all these loops uh, going around the top of this mountain, uh, that's me. And um, it's very steep terrain. I don't want to say cliffs uh, because they weren't cliffs, but uh, exposed rock surfaces that were very steep. And um, so we couldn't exactly do a straight line and not to mention the shape of the mountain itself. So that's why it kind of looks a, a little um, strange in in terms of the, the way we searched the mountain because we had an idea of where we thought it was and then we expanded from there uh, as time went on. Now, my brother was along for this trip as well. And so if you see in the spaces in between the, the line that I sort of marked with, with my GPS tool, um, my brother was searching those all those spaces in between, up above and below. Um, and so we practically covered the upper third of the mountain three or four times uh, throughout um, this first trip. And uh, ultimately, we were unsuccessful finding uh, any sign of caves. We found some evidence of large rocks that had a big enough space where a man could fit in, but no cave whatsoever that um, somebody could fit in. We went back to the uh, drawing board, so to speak, and we contacted a relative of ours who is a sort of a cave guy. He's a certified cave, cave rescue person. He was on this show a while back, and um, he helped us kind of figure out where we went wrong. He helped us look up the old newspaper articles, and we came up with a plan and we actually came across an article that we had missed that gave a better, much better description of where the caves were. And so um, we've been really, at that point, we were, we were basically off, I want to say, by about 50 yards or so. And that kind of stunk because we were so close. And we, we knew we were close. We just based on the first round of research and not knowing the area, it was good that we went out there and we saw um, the sort of layout of the mountain. And when we went back and checked the research again, um, we were able to um, 
realized that we were really close. So this picture is, is from the second trip. Um, it was much um, a much warmer day, but it had snowed uh, and rained the week before. Started off cold. We had our winter gear, and uh, by the time we got to the top of the mountain, we basically shed the winter gear, and um, and I was super overheated at that point in time. Um, but the the second trip, bringing all the gear. Um, this time we had the research with us. Um, I, I brought my uh, iPad with all the research. And um, basically what I did is I took images from Google. And I'm going to show you something. Um, this is not the location of the cave. But this is sort of the an example of the terrain. And Google... Um, was not much help at all in uh, in trying to find where the cave might be because it's such a very dense forest. And occasionally you could see like a, a path or, or a, a road or something like that. But if you're really looking for something um, that has been described as quite hidden, uh, Google is no help whatsoever. This is Google Earth. So basically... That grid search that we did um, gave us an idea of where we should look next and allowed us to take a second trip. Now, we're not sort of the ones to give up and um, going on a an expedition that <laughs> is not... Uh, the easiest to begin with. I mean, it's exhausting to get out there. Um, what we did is we were using, um, I was using the Map My Hike app, and that's the, the uh, basically I use it just for fun to show how many miles that we did. And, and um, we were, first time we did 8.2 miles uh, worth of hiking. And the second time we kind of knew exactly where we were going, we um, ultimately uh, ended up finding evidence from the expedition in the 1960s and 70s that um, went out to to sort of prove or disprove the story. And so we actually found evidence from their descriptions and what they put up on the mountain to sort of be able to find their way. And as soon as we found that, we were very excited because we were knew we were on the right trail. And I'm, I'm sort of being secretive here, and here's the reason why. So the reason why I'm being secretive is because this is such a neat spot. It is probably the most serene and beautiful area that I have been in. And immediately from parking the car and seeing no trailhead and and um, this, this particular area um, is visited by people very rarely and there's proof of that because when you go out there, there's evidence of moose everywhere. I mean, I've never seen one out in the wild, but there it's literally everywhere out there. There's evidence of moose, whether it's, um, um, I'm just not even gonna go into it. There's so much evidence and so much wildlife. There's streams and brooks and, and small, um, I guess a brook would be a small river. Uh, and it's just such an amazing spot that is literally not touched at all by people and being somebody that is interested in technology it's nice to appreciate something like that that has very little traffic to people and in fact um, we ultimately did go and we did find these caves and so we were walking along and um this time we were on a mission. We got to the top of the mountain. We caught our breath literally for about 30 seconds and we were off going in the location that we thought this was. And based off this new evidence, we, we hiked around um, for about 10 minutes. We came across the store, some of the evidence from the, the trip in the 60s and that got me excited. That was the, my favorite part of the whole story. Um, finding proof that of what uh, these people had said was up there and then we knew we were close so at this point it's no longer a, a wild goose hunt it is um, 
where is it? And so it took us about 15 to 20 minutes of searching at that point. And um, we were sort of establishing a grid search, but it wasn't really at this point. It was more or less, you look here, I look there. And luckily enough, I was... um, just fortunate enough to be the first one. And I I immediately yelled to my brother and said, hey, you need to come check this out because um, it is probably probably it. And sure enough, uh, it was a cave and we found it. It was half buried in snow and ice. We climbed down. Now, here's the thing. Um, This time of year, Uh, it's actually illegal to go inside of a cave in our area. Apparently, about 10 years ago, there was a very serious virus for bats, and uh, the name is escaping me right now. The virus was wiping out the bat population, especially during the hibernating season when the bats were close together. Uh, So many of the caves during wintertime now are... are, um, you're not allowed to go in because of bat hibernation season. And so not knowing exactly when that hibernating season is over, we decided not to go into the caves. But what we're going to do is we're going to meet up with our relative, who is the the cave guy that I was talking about. Uh, We're going to take a third trip out very soon, and we're going to um, do some exploring and see how big these caves are uh, at a point in the near future. Uh, probably three or four weeks from now. Um, the thing that's stopping us right now is the um, the corona outbreak, and we're trying to um, be socially distant and trying not to um, gather in large groups. So my brother and I, as we were hiking, we kept our distance from each other. We were about, I'd say, 15 to 20 feet apart the whole time. We were both taking our own, on our own routes. So we were being very careful Um but it also allowed us to get out and get some fresh air and that type of thing. Um, so I found a cave first and then we did some exploring. My brother found caves two, three, and four, um, that were sort of part of the first cave system. And then, um, we based off the research, we knew there was more and we hadn't really found, we weren't sure if we found the big cave or not, And uh, we started to um, sort of search some more. And ultimately, my older brother uh, found the large cave entrance. Now, the the cave itself is massive, uh, the entrance. And it the pictures that I took sort of didn't do it very uh, much justice because um, it's in a very overgrown area. And it was hard to find, um, even if you, you knew where to look. And that was the most exciting part about it. Um, so it was a challenge from the very beginning. So uh, going back from somebody who was on a, a, a search to find an underground bunker, coming across a story of a huge cave that I've never heard of, um, wanting to know if that was a myth, um, that somebody found caves that were as big as um, Mammoth Cave in Kentucky. Um, now, Mammoth Cave is, at this point, it's over 400 miles long. Um, I sort of knew getting into it that that wasn't going to be the case up here. Um, but the fact that there was a group in the 60s that went up and found the caves, they disproved his theory uh, they couldn't find a huge cave that was um, anywhere near in size to what he said. So it was later thought that this was an exaggeration of some kind. And uh, even though this person wasn't supposedly one that was known to exaggerate. And so they did find the caves and they did um, go in. They did some research. They found um, all the evidence that um, Elmer Thomas mentioned in the caves, so they had an idea that they were in the right caves. And um, then by mid 70s, mid 80s, the area that um, this is all in began to uh, seriously overgrow. And um, I, I believe that I came across the idea that, that the reason Elmer Thomas found this was because of a forest fire around that time uh, had cleared away some of this, the, um, the tops of this ridge of the mountain. And so um, by the 80s, this was all being overgrown again and uh, less and less people uh, go to this area. 
And over time, it sort of gets forgotten about again. And um, I'm sure there are locals that live close by that that are aware of this. And I'm not trying to say it's a secret thing by any means. But look, so here's the idea. Uh, this is sort of the moral of the story. Um, this was sort of a local historical thing that I came across for my area. Now, wherever you live, wherever you are, there's probably in um, local history that you're unaware of, you don't, uh, you've never heard of. Um, this is not something that I like to do. I'm not a cave person. I don't like bats. And every article I read across said there was bats everywhere in these caves. Um, I like moose, but I don't want to come face to face with a moose. Uh, I like bear and I don't want to meet one eight miles into the woods with no trail. Um, so this is not something that I would recommend anybody, uh, who is uh, just a casual hiker go to. Um, but it was an adventure in learning and using technology to help you find something that I didn't even know existed. So again, I was using, um, New York State Historic Newspapers Archive, which is online. And I'm sure every other state or country must have something similar. So go look up historic newspapers and try to find interesting topics from way back when. And you never know what you're going to come across. So the idea here is don't be afraid to uh, branch out a little bit, do some research. And when you find something interesting, Try to prove it, disprove it, do whatever you can to, to see if it's actually true, if it's true but not quite the original story, and see where that takes you. And if it's something like this, um, whether it's an underground bunker asking permission to visit an underground bunker or uh, a cave eight miles into the wilderness, you know, it's, it's, it's a journey that I think, you know, doesn't have to be for everybody, but whatever you're interested in, check it out and do your research and see what you can come across. Now, in this case, <clears throat> there are applications here that I'm really not professionally trained in, like search and rescue and, and um, the fact that we probably did history's worst grid, skirt, grid search that you could ever imagine. Um, but we covered the whole upper third of this mountain and we did a pretty good job searching all of this stuff. And um, there are apps that you can use. Um, one that I came across afterwards, uh, Volunteer Rescue. It's an iOS app. Uh, has things like a GPS tracker. Um, you can set up kit lists. You can um, uh, add all sorts of different things like map navigation. You can set waypoints, coordinates, uh, intersection of two paths. And, and I haven't checked this app out yet, but it looks really fascinating. A lot of other um, people use this Gaia GPS for mapping their hikes and such. And I've mentioned this before on the show. I don't use it very often um, because Map My Hike has always worked well for me. But I did notice the other day as I was um, putting together Map My Hike that um, there's all sorts of other apps that are similar to Map My Hike. There's Map My Walk, there's Map My my ride um, for walking and bike riding. And I, I guess they're um, with Map My Hike is basically at end of life right now. And they want you to use Map My Walk, which is basically the same thing. Uh, all the apps were basically the same thing. Um, so I was never sure why they had multiple ones to begin with. Um, but I just noticed it was uh, basically at end of life and they're not supporting it anymore. So I'm going to have to either use Map My Walk or I'm going to have to check out Gaia in the future. Um, this volunteer rescue app I'm is available on iOS and on um, Android. So is Gaia, uh, as well as Map My Hike. The if you noticed, I haven't shown a location of the cave. I hadn't shown any pictures of the cave, and the reason why I have not done that is because. There's something special about a place that is pretty wild. And this cave, there are no images on Google whatsoever of this particular cave. Now, I'm not saying it's the greatest cave in the world, uh, but it is quite interesting. Um, it is 
a series of small caves. Some uh, you can crawl in. Some are quite large openings. Uh, and then there's the huge, huge cave, what I'm going to call the, the big cave, um, that, that we want to explore. There was um, definitely lots of ice and snow still up there, uh, as well as the uh, bat hibernation season. We're not really sure exactly when that ends. Um, the reason I'm not showing pictures is because there's something special about not posting pictures online when there's nothing uh, online to begin with. Uh, I think that's kind of cool and I want to keep it that way. We did find the caves um, and uh, there's been a few people I've sent the pictures to uh, that can sort of speak for it. Um, some of them are in the Discord chat room and um, if you're in Discord chat and you want to see these photos, I'll definitely uh, send them to you sort of uh, privately, but I'm not going to share it publicly. And I'm going to keep it that way. It's it's more of a fun thing, um, and I hope you can kind of respect that a little bit. But um, I just thought I would share this story with you because it was a fun project, uh, and is sort of related to the last uh, episode 175 that I did a while back. So um, the caves were real. We've been to them. It was a lot of fun. It was trial and error. It was uh, not giving up the first time that we ran into problems. And we were very close. We were wondering if even the second time we were going to find them. So I hope that uh, this inspires you to maybe uh, do some research on your own of your own area. Um, but you also have to remember that um, luckily where we were going, it was state land and um, we didn't have to worry about private property or anything like that. If you're going and you're doing your research and you come across something interesting that is on privately owned property, the thing that has always worked for me is if I'm going to contact a property owner, I'm going to explain to them, look, I'm very interested in this subject, whatever it is. Uh, for example, the missile silos. Uh, I'm very interested in missile silos. I know a lot of people trespass on, on these properties. Um, I don't want to do that. I want to be safe. I want to be respectful of your property. I am not here to cause trouble. I just want to take a look around and I'll learn a little bit. And usually that tends to work. And if, if uh, people are willing to work with you, great. If they're not, then you have to kind of respect that and um, move on to something else. And that's kind of what we did with the underground bunker. We were, um, uh, the bunker was sold and it's owned by a storage company now, still being used to store things, and the company just doesn't have the resources to to um, want to take the time to do that. So I was really looking forward to a tour of that underground bunker, but it's, it's just not going to work out right now. Who knows, maybe 10 years from now, maybe that'll be sold to another company, and then we can get a, a, a tour of it. Um, so hope you enjoyed this episode. It was a little different. And uh, I'm going to get back to more technology topics soon, but this has been something that's been taking a lot of my time, and I really hope that um, it was interesting in some way. Um, not sure how this fits on the audio podcast version of this show, um, but there is a video version on YouTube you can check out. It's got a lot of images as uh, of the of the trip, but again, being a little secretive as to not give away the location of this particular place. That's going to do it for this week, guys. Thanks so much for listening. We will see you next time. <laughs>